dear friends, as you can see, we are with Mandana Shiva. She's a well-known thinker, writer, a physicist, uh, an activist, uh, an ecofeminist, uh, with millions of people that follow her proposals all around the world. It would take us all the interview to enumerate all her works uh, and the projects she's involved in. You work at grassroots level with different organizations, but also at governmental level. You have uh, opposed uh, the power denouncing important companies. So it will be hard to enumerate everything you've done, uh, but in a word, we would like you to tell us uh, what uh, do all the causes you defend have in common? Everything I work on is... Uh, rises from within me as the love for life and love for freedom, no matter what it is, whether it be forest protection or protecting the sea or being with my women's sisters, the farmers, or defending the land and the soil. Um, it's all about defense of life from a place of love and the defense of freedom from a place of resistance to unfreedom. You speak about uh, decolonization and you oppose the ecofeminism to the capitalist patriarchy and you speak about uh, decolonizing nature, women and the future. If you think of it, the same processes of colonization, which is the project of capitalist patriarchy, uh, colonize nature, turn land, from being a commons into private property, turn seed from being a commons into intellectual property, turn human beings from being autonomous into being users of algorithms and machines. Um, the enclosures of the commons is at the heart of colonization. And the colonization of nature is related very much to the colonization of women. Colonization of women, exactly like the earth as terra madre, was turned into land as terra nullius, the empty land. Women, as autonomous, creative, productive beings who actually sustained the economy and society, were turned into empty bodies, objects to be exploited. And all the work that we do, all the creativity, all the knowledge we have was turned into non-knowledge and non-work. But these same processes of colonizing nature and colonizing women absolutely undermine the very foundations of life. Uh, when you over-exploit a river, you are killing that river. But that river is the water for people today and people tomorrow. Or when through greed and blindness you burn fossil fuels and you use chemicals in agriculture and you emit 50% of the greenhouse gases that lead to climate change, you are stealing the future from future generations, which is why the young people are very awake to the climate crisis and you have movements like Fridays of the Future but what is missing still is the interconnectedness between the three colonization. And the day humanity wakes up to this, the, the power of the earth and the power of people will be a creative power that is absolutely unstoppable to bring change. We are gonna touch on that later. But you have said that it it's something that it comes within in defense of life. I don't know if uh, you have had an experience or a series of experiences, uh, whether at inner level or in your rel relationship with the people, that has led us uh, to become an activist in defense of life. Someone or something that um, was that turning point and made you becoming engaged with uh, these movements? 
and causes? So, you know, my basic training is as a physicist and I did my PhD in quantum theory. So my intellectual training is non-separation, yeah? Everything is related. My intellectual training is potential. The idea that women are biologically inferior is essentialism created by capitalist patriarchy. Women have to be important players in the economy, in democracy, in culture. So the issue of non-separation and potential is part of my very education. My involvement with ecological issues and my waking up to perceiving the violence of capitalist patriarchy and then shaping a philosophy that recognized that nature is creative, women are creative, began with a particular personal experience. I was leaving for Canada to do my PhD and I'd done a little trek to a favorite forest. My father had been a forest conservator. I'd visited these forests throughout my childhood and this particular oak forest was gone. It had been converted into an apple orchard and the stream that came from the oak forest was a trickle. And it, I felt like part of me had been amputated because I'd grown up in these forests and I was troubled. And I started to talk on my way back to Delhi. I stopped at a tea shop mm -hmm. and the tea shop informed me about the new movement, Chipko. And uh, the Chipko means to hug and was started by women in my region in the hills. So I was leaving for Canada, but I made a commitment. I'll come back every vacation and volunteer for this amazing movement. So I always say I did my PhD in quantum theory at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, but I did my PhD in ecology and ecological activism in the University of Chipko in the mountains of my region. So that was really what shaped my commitment to be an ecological activist and also constantly be informed that no matter where the destruction of nature was, women were the ones who were rising, not because their genes told them to be closer to nature, but they have been left to take care of the basic issues, providing food and fuel and water, <coughs> which was considered not work. It was not considered the economy. So they were left to, to provide the real needs that sustain society. And therefore, they became experts in sustenance. They became experts in survival. They became experts in ecology. Second big shift took place when in 1984, two very violent events took place in India. One was an uprising of farmers in the state of Punjab, which is where the Green Revolution, chemical farming, industrial agriculture was first introduced to the third world. Till then, it was only in the industrialized world. But chemicals brought to the third world was called green revolution. And this was not green. It was not revolutionary. It was just violent. It was military technologies brought to agriculture and our relationship to nature. And it ruined the state of Punjab. So farmers were uprising. 84. Same year in the city of Bhopal, the same companies that made the chemicals had a leak of a pesticide plant. And thousands of people have died, thousands died in the city of Bhopal. I was then working for the United Nations University on a program on peace and global transformation in a particular focus on conflicts over resources. And I said to the UNU, something's going on here and I want to look. So I did a book on the Green Revolution, the violence of the Green Revolution. And, you know, because for me, knowledge is not a career, you know, for me, research is not about adding another publication on a curriculum vitae. For me, knowledge is the guide to action. And if you know something is wrong, mm -hmm. then I will do everything to prevent that wrongness from continuing, both through my knowledge as well as my action. And that's when I committed myself to look both con continuously research on the violence of the poison cartel and industrial agriculture. And that's why over 36 years, I've ended up becoming an expert in this mm -hmm. field just to avoid the harm. And I started, I committed myself to promote a nonviolent farming. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've done since 84. And as a result of that work, I was invited to a meeting in 87 where the 
poison cartel now wanted to own the seat and claim that it's a, it's a machine they invent in the lab and they have to have patents and they want a global treaty to impose this on the world. That's the day I started to save seats and started the movement of Dania. And every one of my major shifts has been triggered by a major injustice and violation against the earth and people, and especially women. You have mentioned uh, different causes, movements, uh, and today all those causes and movements uh, come together. We will be living in a different situation. So how do you think that since there are so many organizations uh, and uh, networks that being built all over the planet uh, but do you think what do you think it takes uh, to get uh, such a uh, critical mass uh, that will be able to change the direction uh, of the events at planetary level what would it take or how can we contribute for that moment to take place? Well, you know, I started, as I said, my, my ecological work really after Chipko in the early 70s. Um, my intellectual work, of course, is much older. And my, my feminist history is from the time I was born, I had amazing parents who were feminist, M amazing mother who was a feminist before her. The name was in the vocabulary. Uh, we have witnessed in these few centuries, colonialism as the expression of capitalist patriarchy, the convergence of the power of violence, of, of greed and money-making with domination over women. But this same capitalist patriarchy is related to anthropocentrism, the idea that human beings are superior to other species. It's related to what I have called ecological apartheid, that we are separate from nature. And it's exactly at the same time, same t processes were then also creating a new racism that somehow people of color are inferior to whites because colonialism had to be justified by the superiority of a religion, Christianity, a skin, whiteness, a gender, maleness. All of this was one package. When you see it as a system, it was one package deal. It's just that movements grew over time addressing particular facets of this common war against life. Yeah? It was a war against life and the war against autonomy and a war against self-organization and the war against diversity. But all of these facets were interconnected with the root cause and the root form. The cause was colonialism and capitalist patriarchy. The, the driving forces were greed and extraction and make money where you can by any means that you can and create narratives to prove and justify your exploitation as the civilizing mission, you know? I'm not exploiting you, I'm civilizing you. If you are what you are without me, you're a barbarian, you're primitive, you're inferior. And that narrative has broken mm -hmm. the movements. It has fragmented the movements. So you have a Black Lives Matter and you have a women's movement and quite separately, you have a Fridays of the future, talking about the future. You have a rights Mother Earth movement, totally separate from gender justice and anti-racism and, and the interests of future generations. So what do we have to do now that we know we have a 10-year window of transition? We know if we don't shift in the next 10 years, we will destroy the conditions of human life on earth like we have destroyed the conditions of other life on earth. So, you know, this is not speculation. It's about extrapolating a graph where what was done to other species now start, or other cultures, you know, the ecocide of 
different species, the genocide of indigenous people, it's all there. Femicide of women, it's there. It's there as evidence. So those who over talk about evidence-based science, this is evidence-based science, that you are on the road to collapse and extinction. But you think you're so superior that you're going to escape to Mars and somehow survive while you ruin this planet. So first of all, we have to wake up to the 10-year window. Secondly, we have to wake up to the common roots of the injustices. Yeah, Not the expressions that are different, but the roots that are common. The third thing we have to do is realize that we have the creative power. As Gandhi said, we have the power to be the change we want to see. We don't have to wait for someone to come and say, wake up. The waking up comes from within. That's why I constantly come back. So this power lies within us. And the separation has been imposed. The non-separation is the reality of our lives, our non-separation with nature, our non-separation as humans, our non-separation with future generations. These non-separabilities is, is as pukka, as, as much of a law as the laws of quantum theory of non-separation. And we need to understand the quantum non-separability between us and other species and within the human species. And once we shift that consciousness, then all kinds of possibilities become available. And I say this with, again, experience and evidence-based science that I've done this work. I began with saving little seeds. And now we have a whole system of food and farming that can solve the climate problem, address the uh, soil problem, can address the health catastrophe, does not have to create pandemics like this invasive agriculture of growing GMO soya in the Amazon, gives us good health and creates justice at every level. It's all doable. It's in our histories. And that's why the indigenous people have to be a very important bridge to the future. It's in the expertise of women who, against all odds, continue to sustain society. So women have to be the leaders in this transition. And we have to realize we are one. We are one with nature. We are one as humanity. And we have a common life as one humanity on one planet. That waking up opens up windows that have been shut by capitalist patriarchy and prevent us from moving, prevent us from changing, prevent us from being the agents of change. Would you add to what you have just said uh, any other tangible or intangible element that we can add uh, in building this non-violent future we aspire? Well, you know, all of my life's activism, as I mentioned, began with the Chippewa movement, which is a very Gandhian movement. And every action that I've been engaged in has been inspired by non-violence against the forces of violence, whether it be the forces of violence in Punjab, uh, destroying agriculture, the Green Revolution, industrial agriculture, forces of violence of pesticides at the Union Carbide Plant, forces of violence of the Monsanto's wanting to own seed and uh, violate its integrity through genetic engineering. So three lessons that I have lived and learned and lived is first, Swarat self-organization. Yeah. We have to realize we are beings who are autonomous. Yeah, we are not objects. And as self-organized beings and as autonomous object, well, subjects linked to others in mutuality. Yeah, we are autonomous but interconnected. We are self-organized but diverse. When we see that, then self-organization becomes both a duty and a right. And it starts to shape different politics. Everywhere in the world, voting has become a crisis because voting has been hijacked by big money. And instead of governments being off the people, by the people, for the people, everywhere you see they're off the corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations, or off the billionaires, by the billionaires, for the billion. So representative democracy is failing the earth and failing humanity. 
we need a deeper participatory democracy and it comes from everyone realizing but i can make a difference i don't have to wait for who i elect because my influence on elections today is very small compared to the impact of big money on elections so we have to be the change where we are the second globalization of the last 30 years has been a recolonization and if you just look at the figures of greenhouse gas emissions you look at the figures of extinction of species you look at the four figures of the water crisis you look at the refugee crisis these last 30 years have been devastating for society and the planet so we have to relocalize the economy we have to reecologize the economy i call it creating living economies the third is the power of conscience the power of truth a lot of people feel helpless when governments influenced by influenced by big money write laws to take away the freedom of ordinary people and then you feel oh my god what do i do so the british tried to do it in india or they tried to do it in south africa they tried to do it in india making it illegal for us to make our own salt from our own water from our own sea they passed a salt law that they had a monopoly on salt making so they could get the royalties gandhi walked to the beach picked the salt from the sea and said nature gives it for free we need it for our survival we will continue to make salt and we will not obey our laws and that was called the satyagraha the force of truth i took inspiration from that so when i saw the monsantos of the world wanting to own the sea through patenting and genetic engineering we started a seed satyagraha like the salt satyagraha we said it's you don't invent the seed this is a lie we will save seeds and we will not accept laws that make it illegal for us to save and save share seeds because this is our duty to the earth to each other and to future generations and not giving your consent to unjust brute violent laws is the highest expression of being human and is the highest expression of our freedom thank you very much would you like to add anything else would you like no, to add no. any other comment be good thank you so much it's been wonderful to be with you thank you bye 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 thank you very much bye